Heroin is killing more people in King County than it used to, especially young people in their 20s. Researchers from the University of Washington released a new report today. They said the number of people dying from heroin overdoses jumped from near 100 to 150 in just one year. We now have a story about the victims of heroin, and you're not going to meet a single person who uses the drug. These are heroin's innocent victims, neighbors, family members, even the environment. Many of the innocent victims have the bad luck of living near a drug house. Snohomish County has almost 100 of them. The sheriff created a special drug task force to fight the ugly problem and invited King 5's Dan Casuto along for the journey. Watch out for needles and stuff. Seeing two people in here, so we're all here again. Okay, come out, come out and chat with me a second. The first stop on the heroin highway. Okay, let's go walk the property. Is a garage sale. All this stuff is easy to get rid of. It's easy to trade. There's lawnmowers, an air conditioner, one, two, three, ten car stereos. Where are they getting the stuff? The victims are the true owners. Uh, there's kids' bikes all over the place. I haven't seen one kid here. Deputies think this is a giant garage sale of stolen property. It's taken out of houses, out of garages. 20 bucks for one of these items buys a few days of heroin. All that scrap that's in the back of that trailer, where'd it come from? That's the first time I've ever seen that. It's a suspicious thing. Small time crime like this is twice as bad as it was just a couple years ago in Snohomish County. You know, it ends up in places like this, unfortunately. Come to the door. The drug task force visits this house every other Thursday. We, we met before you, right? Deputies can give you the addresses of a hundred more that are even worse. Sounds like there's a ton of people in here. They're neglected, abandoned, filthy. It looks like human feces right there. Used needles tossed around like peanut shells. Sheriff's office, come to the door, please. Deputies can't get the owners to clean up because they're in jail in another state, or the owner is a bank that just doesn't care. What do you think's happening inside now? Oh, they're all just waking up from sleeping off their heroin. I just woke up. I'm going Listen, back to the house. We haven't done anything wrong. We haven't no here's, called about here's, here's, here's what you're doing wrong. The heroin addicts live with no power, so they steal it from their neighbors. One man showed us this video from his backyard. Here I noticed that there was a, a cord out one morning and we unplugged it and tossed it back. He says he caught the heroin addict stealing his electricity with a 50 foot power cord. It's never ended. Neighbors have called 911 hundreds of times. At this house in Linwood, deputies have found stolen cars, wanted felons, and plenty of drugs. Sheriff's office, we can't go do anything. But if we had better county ordinances that would allow us to, you know, shut this place down, board it up for 90 days, get the garbage out of here. Those are ways to help. You know, we just don't have that right now. Any drug paraphernalia? The victims of heroin don't live in this squalor. They live next door. When I look out my window, I see that garbage. Deputies also don't have anything to help Cindy Perkins. Well, it's depressing. I just get in bed and cry every night. Cindy is an innocent victim of heroin. She lives in a nice condo near a problem house. They have no respect for anybody's property. They dump garbage in the back. They dump it over there. They dump it across the street. They dump it on our property in the back, and I've had it. I want somebody to do something. The heroin addicts next door live in a place with no running water, so they steal it. Like this, it unlocks it. At least they did, until the condo put water spigots under lock and key. Unscrew, and I can, you know, get my water. Cindy's called 911 about once a week for the last three years. I've got copies of it. We went next door to meet the neighbors. House is under foreclosure. Um, you, guys, who, you guys are under borrowed time here, yeah. Out back, we saw another heap of garbage and lounging on the patio. Is there needles back there? Another innocent victim of heroin. So we've been waiting outside because we don't want to go inside. Why did you want to go inside? Because there's just a bunch of heroin addicts in there. I don't, I don't associate myself with them, so I say out here. I just sit out here with the flies and sit in with them. Austin Basham is 19 years old. Heroin is not stealing his water or his power. Um, she's the one that brought me into the world. Heroin is stealing his mother. Like you see all the garbage back here. That's probably the like, nicest place she's been in like six months, probably. I tell her a day and like I want to do better, but it's it's something like she's gonna have to choose. It's not like something I can tell her. I've told her multiple times. I've tried to get into rehab multiple times. It's something I can't do. It's something she's gonna choose to do. They don't care. When you have an addiction like that with heroin, your life goes from you care about yourself to you're just trying to get by. You're trying to get your next high because you don't want to get sick. As bad as these houses are, the last stop on the heroin highway is the worst. <laughs> 
The commander of the drug task force, Lieutenant Rob Palmer, took us through a hole in the fence to a hole in the woods. How you been? What happened to your face? I got in a scuffle with somebody. You all right? You need medical attention? This campground is a dead end for many heroin addicts. People who have no place else to go. The commander comes to places like this because people like this have hit the very bottom. For them, number one is drug. They live with the rats. They are slowly killing themselves along with the land. They burn trash, car batteries, and printers. Setting the woods on fire probably ain't the right way to go about that. Toxins seeping into the soil, chemicals creeping into the air. Well, every time it rains, that, that's just flushing out here into the ground. Heroin's innocent victim here is the earth. No fires. Even though it's green, this place to go up like that. Lieutenant Palmer showed up today to tell campers some bad news. Maybe it's good news. I mean, it's going to be a 14 day notice. The county is going to bulldoze the campground, kick everyone out. It'll be a huge cleanup. It all stems from our heroin problem. But only a small dent in the fight to help the helpless victims of heroin. The homeless camp is about 100 yards back there in the woods. The commander says he's hoping to have all this cleaned up and bulldozed by July. That's also when he's going before the county council asking for more resources and more ordinances to help in this fight and to help the victims and also the addicts like that man that you saw briefly living in that tent. That addict also told the deputy something that people living in camps don't usually tell them. He's planning to get help. Lori. So, Dan, I do have a question about those houses. Is there any way the county can actually take over those houses and, and clean them out, raise them to the ground, just like they plan to do out there in the woods? Lori, that's the biggest hurdle for the deputies and the whole task force is that they can't go inside the houses and clean the garbage up or the needles themselves because they can't find whoever owns the house to give them the permission to do that. In some cases, the owner is in jail or they live in another state. They just don't care about the house. Some cases, the deputies can't even find who owns the house because of a, a, a very tangled up legal system and legal ownership. And then there are the cases where the homes are foreclosed. So a bank somewhere owns the house and the bank just isn't doing anything to clean it up. That's why that the commander is going before the county council asking for more ordinances so they can get more power just to go in and clean this up themselves. All right, so we are looking for some government action. Thanks, Dan. Interesting story. We found out today the state of Washington set a new record. For the fifth year in a row, the number of heroin overdoses went up. More than 200 people died last year. More than 15,000 people checked into rehab. That's the most and the worst it's ever been. We have a special report tonight on Washington's heroin crisis. King 5's Dan Casuto is here with our story. Lori and Dennis, you just said that 15,000 people went into rehab last year. So think of all the people who are still using heroin and not getting help. They come from all walks of life, and so many of them got addicted the same way from the doctor. That's how a woman named Amber Basham got hooked. She's 35, she's a mom, and she can explain how the heroin crisis got so bad so fast. Amber lives in Everett, just down the road from a nice shopping center. It's a place called The Pit. You know you're not supposed to be here. Heroin junkies built the pit on private property. All the cops do is come down here and just arrest everybody with warrants. If I run your name when you leave, everybody's going to come up with a warrant? No. The deputies are kicking everyone out. No help ever gets offered to them, and nothing ever gets done. That's what I'm used to when it comes to you guys. In a repeated cycle over and over again. So don't come back. Including the woman I came to find, Amber Basham. It keeps getting worse and worse. Do you want to stay hooked on heroin for life? Obviously, nobody does. It's just a wrong path to go down, I know that. You lose everything, and it's hard to get out of it. This is Amber's son, Austin. He's 19. Yep. Uh, my mom used to be like at all my football games and like a real family person, and now I don't, I don't see her for like three weeks on end or something like that, so. Her kids are forgiving. He's, he's forgiven me for what I've done and loves me regardless. I'm his mother, of course. I still love my mom as much, so, yeah. You can follow Amber's story with her mug shots. Last year, the year before, the year before that. When you go back eight years, you see Amber Basham before heroin. It started like all oh, when like when uh, she had pills for her feet. I had the surgery and was out for nine weeks, was put on pills. Once I took that away from her, 
she was still hurting. Because the doctors overprescribed pills. She had nothing, so she had to go buy pills off the street. That's the main key for everyone's problems, is pills. The scenario you see nowadays is there's a gateway drug. Pills turn into heroin. Percocet, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, they're called opiates. They're heroin's chemical cousin, and they accidentally created today's heroin crisis. The gateway drug is the prescriptions we write for. Steve Anderson is an emergency room doctor at the Auburn Regional Medical Center and a top national expert on heroin. Oh, doctors sort of woke up around 2008 and said, whoa, we're, we might be part of the problem here with all of what we're writing. At its peak in 2008, pills killed 512 people in Washington. So we started to take some ownership on it. The medicine cabinet was more deadly than car crashes. And we cut down on writing as much in the way of opiates. I think I started by snorting it. Sooner or later, there's no oxycodone around, and somebody says, well, heroin will do the same thing for you, and it's a lot cheaper. I was like, oh, this is just like a pill. <laughs> and it just progressed from there, went from smoking it to shooting it. That's the people that start down that pathway. And that's pretty much what everybody else's story is. I see the students. I see the person that goes to work at the factory. All those groups are getting addicted. So much more addictive, I think. The lucky ones get help for their addiction. In Kitsap County, today there are more heroin rehab programs than Starbucks. It was the drug that was ruining my life. A decade ago, you could have fit every heroin junkie in treatment into this one room. Back then, there were six people, six. I needed to come to terms with the fact that I needed help. Today, there are 153. Relapse? No. No. 30 needles or else. Over the past decade, every county in Western Washington had a heroin boom like this. Take a deep breath. The number of users in treatment exploded from 5,000 to 15,000. Tolerating the medicine well. And the state is paying dearly. It's costing $30 million more than it was a decade ago to treat these addicts. And remember, they're the lucky ones. Have you ever gone to rehab? I haven't had the option or choice to. As a society, we're also paying dearly for the addicts like Amber who don't get help. When they build their illegal camps in the woods, we pay $5,000 a day to bring in the big machines to clean it all up. When they dump their dirty needles next to Interstate 5, we pay to pick them all up. I mean, they're low lives. I mean, obviously all they do is steal to just get a high. And who do you think is paying for the heroin itself? Does your mom steal? Does my mom steal? No, my mom's too smart for that. How does she get her money? That is a question I would not answer on camera. I don't know how she gets her money, but she comes up on her money. People do all sorts of things to afford it, from stealing right on down to prostitution. Anything for the drugs. Heroin, you get sick. It's not a want, it's a need. So you don't want it no more. It's You need it. So it's an everyday habit. There's no choice. When I met Amber, there was a warrant for her arrest. Deputies decided to let her walk away. They said tonight she's in no shape to go to jail. Jail was the best option for another heroin addict named Robin Bosch. She was barely 21 when she was arrested. I see my daughter trying, trying to kill herself. When we come back after the break, what Robin's parents had to do to find her, how they put her in jail, and the unbelievable, unlikely stranger who made it possible. I got a private Facebook message from somebody that I had no idea who he was. We continue now with Robin's story. Very active and very happy and um, extroverted when she was young. Robin Bosch came from a good family in Gig Harbor. She was social, she was happy. Her mom, Christina, is a fire station manager. Yeah. Her dad, Robert, is a paramedic. As if she could just see what we see in her. It was the fall of 2012. Robin was 21. She would come home, ask for money. We would say no, she would explode. She was working at this restaurant drive through in Bremerton when her boyfriend suggested she try heroin. <laughs> Her dad found her passed out in the woods. He recorded this video when he and other paramedics were trying to take her to the hospital. She came home the next day and then wrote her long letter mm -hmm. and disappeared. The phrase was, I want the black. She was choosing the heroin over family and everything else. 
Robert and Christina didn't know at the time, but Robin had run off to Portland. The heroin, it seems, is cheaper and stronger here. We didn't know exactly where she was at. A lot of anxiety. Months went by. Robin wouldn't talk to her parents. I got a private Facebook message from somebody that I had no idea who he was that said he knew her. And we went back and forth a couple of times privately messaging each other. And I finally had to ask how he knew my daughter. I met her on Craigslist. Either he had answered an ad or she had answered a Craigslist ad for money for sex. <laughs> Agreed upon a price, and um, she came out and she spent the night, and things did move on past that. His name's Ron Morse. I tracked him down on the shabby outskirts of Portland. She was going down pretty quick. Now more than two years since he first met and hired Robin on Craigslist. I said, look, you don't know me, um, and I, I know your daughter, and she needs your help. But for some reason, felt that he needed to help this girl. I've done a lot of bad things in my life. I, I saw somebody that she's got, I saw that she's got so much potential. Who would probably kill herself if this went on much longer. I don't know, it just seemed like the right thing to do. That was our only <clears throat> connection he to her. He was the only link that knew where, that parts of town where she was at. So we had to meet, meet him. Very, very nice to me under the conditions. As a dad, I, I wanted to literally throttle this John. Across the freeway, you got to go down this secret little, you know, ramp. Robert couldn't throttle this John, at least not yet. This John knew where to find his daughter. At night, she was living in a homeless camp under the Burnside Bridge. And that's where I heard she was. By day, she was begging for money in the heart of downtown Portland, Pioneer Courthouse Square. I found her. Her mom and dad went to meet her. It's July 2013. Robin is 22. Homeless, hooked on heroin, dirty, and dangerous. It's, it's time to bring her home, so I'm going to go get my girl. Probably not the best approach. <laughs> and Robin socked her mom in the eye. <laughs> Before I knew it, here comes a punch right to the face. They're like, you want to press charges against your daughter? Yes, absolutely. He got arrested right after that, but he got him back together. Whatever it took, we had to get her off of the streets. Robin spent seven months in jail. When she got out, she went right back to the streets of Portland. Heroin owned her. Jail was the best option. Robin's parents checked jail websites every day to see if she was picked up. <laughs> she was. This is our Robin. This is the bright and beautiful young woman right here. Her mugshots became the family album. And then this one, a year later, she's somebody that's in trouble. It's like she's just lost everything. You know, she's got sores on her face. I see my daughter trying to kill herself. I overdosed three times when I was in Portland. I wanted to die. I looked for death, um, but God wouldn't let me. This is Robin Bosch today. Hi there. She's 24. I went to a hospital with detox. Three years after shooting up for the first time and overdosing three times, Robin is back in Washington getting help. It finally got to the point where I couldn't take who I was on drugs anymore. I was mean. I was hurtful. Robin says she was ready for help after living almost two years on the streets of Portland. She came back home in January. She said she was ready, but she wasn't. It's really hard to do. Um, for the first half of this year, she bounced between rehab and relapse. Well, my sober day is um, July 19th, so. This time, she says it's for real. What kind of things are you doing? Uh, well, I've got group. Um, I've got a sponsor. It's cool to watch you. She bikes to outpatient treatment three days a week. She spends afternoons volunteering at a mission in downtown Breverton. I'm still at the very beginning. I have a long way to go. It's not easy. She has to forgive herself. We're still afraid. It can crash at any moment. We know that. We have our daughter back. Happy family. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a very slow, long process, but She's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give you an update about Robin. I just got off the phone with her parents. In the last couple of weeks, they told me she's still been clean. Now she has a job at Burger King, and she's living in a sober house with some other women in Bremerton. I don't have much of an update about Amber Basham, the mother we talked to in the first part of our story. Police tell me she's still living on the streets, still using heroin.
I want to show you now some of the comments that we've been getting from you all day since we posted some information about this story on Facebook. This is really sad. One mother named Michelle posted this picture of her daughter. Her, her name is Amber, and she died just a few months ago of a heroin overdose. She was 19 years old. We got another post from uh, someone else who said that he lost his 19-year-old daughter to heroin also on June 28th. And then Danielle wrote, it has been in the suburbs since 2000. It went from pharmaceuticals to cheaper street drugs. Look at Monroe, Sultan, Granite Falls, Lake Stevens, and someone else saying the same thing. It's a huge epidemic in the South, too. Olympia, Rochester, Tumwater, and Centralia. You can weigh in on the conversation. Just join us on the King 5 Facebook page. Now back to you guys. Amazing story. Thank you very much, Dan. Well, we have a new report in our series on Washington's heroin crisis. We've reported that the number of people who died from heroin overdoses hit an all-time high last year. Now tonight, King 5's Dan Casuto takes us to Port Angeles, where families are yelling for change. Not in our town. Not our town. These are moms, dads, aunts, and uncles. So fed up with heroin's grip on Port Angeles, all they can do is scream and shake signs. I'm tired of it. It's in my yard. It's at my business. It's at our playground. Here, boys, let's trace your hands. Kaden and his brother Dakota are too young to know it, okay. but they're victims of heroin. It's, tough. it's heartbreaking. We loved the whole family, and it, heroin has stolen them from us. Smile and wave. The boys live with their great aunt, Sandy. Their mom and dad are in rehab for heroin. Wave. What do you worry about? I worry that that they'll die, that their parents will die from an overdose, or that they'll never recover. The boys really want their parents. The boys also want safe playgrounds. Here, over here. All the families do, and heroin won't let them. It's at our playgrounds. You can't take your grandchildren to the park without doing a sweep first. And it's even scarier when you find the calf and you don't find the needle. There's a calf right here. So the thing we have to be careful about is very possible the needle is stuck in the ground. Heroin is so stuck in this community. I just found a syringe. Even the kids spend their Saturdays trying to fix it. I found two needles and a couple of cups. Emily's 13 years old. I met her on the popular trail near Hollywood Beach. This is where teenagers and their families scour for heroin needles, caps, and foil. They use it to smoke the heroin out of. I just wonder like, how people just do that to them themselves. Like, it's like they're just kind of ruining their lives with a dumb mistake. Your uncle? Yeah. Made that mistake? Yeah. So my brother died of a heroin overdose um, almost two years ago in January. And uh, we didn't even know he was using. This is Emily's mom, just Lori. Squim. There are a couple dozen families who do this. They sometimes find 50, 60 needles. All they can do is yell and hope the heroin addicts will listen. We want it safe for the kids. We don't want them to grow up. And it's like a culture. In Port Angeles, Dan Casuto, King 5 News. I've met so many heroin addicts over the past few months and they all tell me they desperately want to quit. They just can't do it on their own. When they wake up in the morning, they feel nauseous, achy, chills, angry. Heroin makes them feel better. So does a medicine called methadone. There are some places in Seattle to get methadone, but I want you to see the obstacles in the way. Because it's an epidemic out there. Basically homeless, wanting to kill myself. Oh, God. It's, it's real bad. Like, it's real bad. It's a dark, damp Wednesday morning. Most of Tacoma is sleeping. The corner of Pacific Avenue and 37th Street must be the most crowded place in town. I come six days a week. Every day. You're looking at hundreds of heroin addicts commuting in the shadows of secrecy. It, I can honestly say it's the best thing I've ever done. 52 weeks a year for years on end. It's a big commitment, yeah. But it's worth it. Uh, but it saved my life. It really is. You know, saved my life. This is the Tacoma Pierce County Public Health Department. And honestly, I'm getting my life together through this program here. They come for the medicine called methadone. A lot of people don't understand methadone. They think, you know, they just judge it. It's cherry color and the gold standard. 
Okay. Of helping addicts replace their body's physical addiction to heroin. Honestly, this stuff tastes nasty, and I'm sick of coming into the clinic. Hey, the routine can become boring. Todd Frederick and his wife, Crystal, might be bored, but that's better than the alternative. He probably would have been dead. Christina Abbey is in charge of the methadone clinic. She helps Todd, Crystal, and 974 other heroin addicts make their painfully slow pilgrimage to sobriety. To see the transformative effect that methadone has on the lives of these people, their families, their communities, it's just a bomb for my soul. A bomb for your soul? A bomb for my soul. It was very bleak. Todd and Crystal started taking methadone a year and a half ago. On heroin, and she becomes pregnant. It wasn't really their decision to make a commitment like this. I look at her and I just feel love. It was Aubrey's. <laughs> She's so beautiful. You used heroin when you were pregnant? Yes, I did. I still feel very guilty for it, you know, and she's here now and she's healthy and happy and, um, sorry, <laughs> taking me back to all those feelings, <laughs> you know, but, um, just a lot of guilt. <laughs> that guilt gave Crystal and Todd the shove they needed to enter treatment and the commitment to stay there. The people graduate to uh, being able to get take home medication. Crystal and Todd earned the privilege to take some of their methadone at home. Uh, it's gonna take us about five years for the whole process. Again, that's still better than the alternative, wanting a better life and hearing this. If an uh, individual came here today and wanted to get on the program, um, the next available appointment for an assessment wouldn't be until March. That's a long time for somebody hooked on heroin. And so what we, we try to do is hook them up with another clinic. Good luck with that. Washington State has 17 methadone clinics. Seven are in King County. The waiting list here is pushing one to two months. And it's different for, for which, like, which clinic you go to. Skyler Hooks is homeless and addicted to heroin. I met him outside the Seattle Needle Exchange. Like right now, just right now, it's so full, it's just like impossible. The wait list here in Everett is even more dire. This is the only methadone treatment clinic in all of Snohomish County. If you want to get help here, take a number and you'll be waiting a while, six months to a year. That's still better than Breverton. There is no methadone clinic here, but there are plenty of hopelessly addicted heroin addicts like Chelsea Main. I have done the methadone program like five times, but in them not having one here in the county, it's kind of hard to transport myself to all the way to Tacoma or wherever they have them, Olympia. Chelsea's got two kids in their 20s. She's been hooked on heroin since they were toddlers. How long did you make it through the last time? The last time, a year and a half a year and a half, and then the time before that was two years, and then um, I think six months. You came so close. I know. What just happened? Getting there. There was supposed to be a methadone clinic in Bremerton. Five years ago, a major treatment provider wanted to remodel this building on Burrell Street. It pisses me off. All they needed was zoning permission from the city council. I'm going to open the public hearing. I think that it's just the wrong place to have this. Um, I think it would only make it a more difficult place to live. We need businesses that, that uplift the community. The community doesn't want a bunch of drug addicts in one area around their, you know, around their businesses and whatnot. That's what I hear anyway. Typically what I hear is a lot of uh, myths. Over in Pierce County, Christina Abbey is helping to draw up plans to open a new methadone clinic and serve more heroin addicts. She says she's fighting the same myths and misconceptions that Bremerton faced five years ago. They're going to bring more crime in the neighborhood. I think the crime rate would drop a lot. You know, there wouldn't be so many people out stealing stuff to get the drug, you know, the heroin. They're going to be shooting it up and dropping their needles. Well, five years later, look what I found on the sidewalk on Burrell Street in Bremerton. There is no methadone clinic here, of course, but the heroin addicts sure are here, except they've still got no place to get help. There's a lot of resistance, and the assumption is, is that it's going to bring addicts into the neighborhood, where well, the reality of it is that people who have substance use disorders are already in the neighborhood. But what if we didn't need new treatment centers to cure the heroin crisis? What if we could stop people from getting addicted in the first place? That's where the snail comes in.
Yes, a slimy, colorful sea creature. When we come back, after the break, how a snail could help pierce heroin's relentless grip. It's a struggle. It's one of the worst drugs out there. Heroin's grip is relentless because it targets your brain. Uh, tore my family up. Tore my family apart. Last fall, we told you Amber Basham's story. All the cops do is come down here and just arrest everybody with warrants. When we met her living in the woods behind a shopping center in Everett. You know you're not supposed to be here, so don't come back. Heroin's grip on Amber's brain started with prescription pain medicine. That's the main key for everyone's problems is pills. When she couldn't get pills anymore, she moved on to their chemical cousin, heroin. Progressed from there, went from smoking it to shooting it. If Amber doesn't shoot up heroin every morning, she gets a horrible flu, chills, aches, throwing up. Heroin, you get sick. It's not a want, it's a need. And it's very, very easy to get addicted. Dr. Sean Idonato thinks he can stop some of these addicts from getting addicted to heroin or prescription pain medicine in the first place. So the drug that we're developing here at Canetta is actually a conopeptide. It's derived from a cone snail that grows off of the coast of the Philippines. I met him at his lab in South Lake Union, where he's chief scientific officer at a pharmaceutical company called Kineta. You told me where your drug is derived from. Yeah. You're going to have to say that again. I think I lost you from a snail. <laughs> yeah, a cone snail that grows off of the coast of the Philippines. A cone snail. Yeah. What is that? Like a a little slimy thing, little, like that kind of snail? E well, they have big, beautiful, hard shells. They're actually a very pretty snail. They're pretty, they're colorful, and they are captivating researchers from all over the world. Where can I find this snail? Well, you have to go scuba diving in the around the Philippines. But how can a sea creature from the Philippines cure the heroin crisis in Seattle? To understand that, you have to watch the cone snail catch lunch. This is video from a research lab at the University of Utah. Watch closely. The snail pierces its lunch with a potent venom. They've evolved all of these different um, components to their venom to, to paralyze little fish that they prey on. And those are actually the things that we're using to control pain. Sean and his team at Kineta are making a man-made version of the snail's venom. It's so powerful, they think a synthetic version could work in humans by treating pain targeting the nerves themselves that are hurting. And it doesn't actually enter the brain, so it doesn't have all of those effects that opioids have. Like Oxycontin, which works on the brain, not the nerves. That's why they're so addictive, and that's why many addicts eventually swap them out for something they can buy cheaply on the street, heroin. Have you ever been to the Philippines to see the cone snail? I haven't, but uh, my daughter actually has a very lovely collection of cone snail <laughs> shells in her bedroom. She's eight. She is, yeah. I couldn't resist to ask Dr. Iodonato to take me to his house, up to his daughter's bedroom. So these are actually both some uh, beautiful cone snails. Who knew? A colorful little creature and possibly one piece of the cure for the heroin crisis. The venom of the snail actually evolved to help the snail catch a fish. And so it's really serendipity that the venom of the snail is really effective in treating pain in, in mammals, in, in, in animals, and in humans. A promising drug, but still a long way away. There's still two more years or so of testing in the lab, and then clinical trials, which could take another two years. I'm in Seattle, Dan Casuto, King 5 News. As Washington's heroin crisis deepens, teens like these are becoming the faces of the epidemic. Loving children who became addicts, caught up in the cycle of addiction, many overdosing and dying before they turn 18. Governor Jay Inslee has just signed a new bill that will make it easier for parents to help their kids. A better word might be force their kids to get help. King 5's Dan Casuto is here with our story. Dan. Well, Mark and Lori, look at it this way. When you're 13 years old, you can't drive, you can't vote, but you can walk away from drug treatment. This new law will let parents make their, make their kids get help. Believe it or not, that doesn't exist right now, and nobody understands that better than this group of women. Their kids started injecting heroin when they were in high school, six or seven years ago, at the very beginning of the heroin crisis. Tonight, I want you to meet the heroin moms. We are good parents. Yeah. We are, we care deeply for our children. These moms are your neighbors. There's Carrie Litowitz from Des Moines, Don Hoffman from Auburn, 
Paula Kramer from Federal Way, and Laura Wilson from Seattle. When you first heard that your son was using heroin, what did you think? I about fell over because heroin are the icky people in the alley. These moms found out those icky people were also their children. They all started shooting up heroin in high school. I'm 14. Your daughter started using heroin at 14? Yes. She blew her ACL. Dawn's daughter, Tiara, was a star soccer player back then, and she needed surgery and pain medicine for her torn ACL. Her doctor gave her Percocet, which works a lot like heroin does on the brain. How did she go from Percocet to heroin? I guess at school there was heroin going around right here in Federal Way High School, and she tried it, and it was cheap, and she said it was the best feeling she'd ever felt. Carrie's son, Nate, also got hooked on heroin thanks to the pain meds in the medicine cabinet. I knew when he was 17, I believe he had been using, uh, smoking the Percocet and the Oxycontin and doing some heroin since 16. So he went from pain pills to heroin. Why did he first start using the pills? Just for fun? He uh, had his tonsils taken out and he was given um, Oxycontin for the pain. And he got addicted. Mm -hmm. That was six years ago. Nate's 22 now, still alive, but in his ninth trip to treatment. All these moms have been through the whirlwind of treatment, expensive doctors, therapists, counseling, and rehab centers. What was the biggest challenge? Getting her to stay in treatment. She realized, I think it was the second first time that she was in, somebody told her, you don't have to stay here. And that's all she needed to hear. What do you mean she didn't have to stay there? How old was she? Uh, 15, I think, at that time. Dawn's daughter walked out the door because the door was wide open, legally and literally. None of the treatment centers in Washington had locks. And even if they did, it wouldn't have mattered. Our job was to raise them and to care for them and to provide for them. And we couldn't do our jobs. Until this year, Washington law gave 13-year-olds the power to walk away from drug treatment. 13 years old. That's also the age when Laura's son, Derek, started using heroin. You, know, you feel as a parent like your hands are tied behind your back. You're trying everything you can do to get your child help, yet every single step, nope, sorry, you have no right to do that, or we can't help him, or you can't do that, or he, he can do whatever you want. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just so frustrating. And by the way, here's the bill. Do you feel like the laws in Washington made it extra difficult or impossible? Impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Not impossible extra difficult, impossible. Oh yeah. my goodness. Like my son, he was very smart and he knew, yeah. he knew that those laws were working on his side right. and, and empowered him. How many times did you take her to a treatment center and then have her just leave? Probably three times. And then I realized that Washington is, uh, they have more rights than we do. So I researched more and shipped her to Oregon. Shipped her to Oregon? <laughs> shipped her, yeah, a couple times. How many of you took your child to another state because of the consent laws? So you three. Yes. And they came about four in the morning. Um, it's, it's awful. Paula decided to ship her son, Michael, to Idaho. He was 15. That's because in Idaho, they have treatment centers with doors that lock and laws that give parents more power. Why did you feel as a parent that's the route you had to go? <laughs> yeah, crazy. Um, because we were desperate. We were absolutely desperate to help our son. If there's any resistance, then they do uh, can legally handcuff her and m make her go, no matter how violent she gets kind of like legally kidnapping your own child. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> I couldn't even watch the first time. We've done it twice. I could not even watch. I was that distraught. As a parent, it's, it's just heartbreaking. There should be something that you can do for your child other than jail. I always said to myself, if he lives to be 25, that will be a miracle. The one thing that was lacking in all of this was the parental power to make medical and life-saving decisions for your child by being able to put them in a facility where they could not leave. 
Well, you just heard Laura say that she wished her son Derek would have lived till he was 25. He didn't make it. He died just a couple of weeks before his 25th birthday. It was also too late for Michael. He died just a few weeks before that. Both of these deaths happened within a few weeks of Memorial Day 2012. The other two kids, though, are still alive, Nate and Tiara. And all these moms told me that if this law were in effect back then, they would have had more options, more hope for their kids. They could have gotten to the point, at least for the two kids who are alive, sooner than they are now. Possibly, possibly uh, reversed course on the two kids that, that passed away. Um, but this new law takes effect in about a month from now. Wow. It's an amazingly difficult task mm -hmm. to get overcome this kind of addiction. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, Dan. Dan, thank you. So if you or someone you love needs help, there is help out there. We have put a link to resources on king5.com. Just look for Dan's story uh, in news links, and we'll be right back.